Let me share a few thoughts by people who have been give, given this uh, ideas over the years. This one is by Leo Tolstoy. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing themselves. Or by Teddy Roosevelt, this one here. The person who is going to succeed must decide to overcome 1,000 obstacles, but not merely to overcome them, to succeed in spite of them and because of them. You get the point. And let's read it, read it from a biblical perspective. The Apostle James, again I mentioned last week, the Apostle James very subtle. That's the way he puts it. Consider it pure joys, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know trials, the testing of your faith, develops perseverance. Cuts to the chase, doesn't it? Just gets it out there throws it before us and he says, listen to this, guys. The reality is, look around. Everywhere you look, there are problems. Why are you surprised when they come your way? Get ready for it. Make the best of it. Make the most of it. He's telling us, it's in how we respond to problems, that's the important part. How we respond to problems. Are our responses based upon our faith and trust in God? And understand this, our faith and trust in God is also dependent upon our willingness to learn from God. Biblical knowledge. Learning the Bible and asking God to help us to understand it. In order to be able to grow, we need a good foundation. It doesn't matter in whatever form, you need a good foundation. I was talking to a friend just the other day. He said he bought his first home and he was so excited. He bought his very first home. He had them come in and do an inspection. He said they were very thorough. And he said and during the winter time, he said the walls in the basement started to weep. And so did he. <laughs> because he knew what the problem was. And so he had the contractor come in and he ripped all of the insulation out. And behind that, he said, there were multiple cracks. It's not a good foundation. And he realized that he had to fix it, because not only did he realize he had to fix it, because his house was now sitting on a very, very uh, questionable foundation. But the city, of course, in their compassion, came alongside and said, oh, you have foundation problems. Oh, yes, this is awful. I bought this house. Never mind you're outside of the code and you have to fix it or else we'll take it down. Isn't that so understanding? But it doesn't matter. The reality is you need a good solid foundation in a home and in our lives too. And that good solid foundation in our lives is knowing God. Knowing the Bible. Our capacity to deal with our capacity to even thrive within the context of the problems that we experience in this life is positively impacted by our knowledge of the Bible and our trust in God. And our faith in God is positively impacted by our knowledge of the Bible. It goes hand in hand. That's the foundation. Let me give you an example, a few examples here as we consider this idea this morning. James says this statement I've always found very curious. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. Now, I'm going to look at this, but we're going to break it down a little bit. I know that you want to consider, what does he mean by consider it pure joy? We'll get to that. You see, you're not ready for it yet. I want to look at the word consider. I like the word consider. Let's consider the word consider, if you don't mind considering that for a few moments. We look at this word consider. What does it mean? Well, consider means a couple of things. Consider it means to think about it, to dwell on it, to focus on it, to look at it. He's saying we have to take a deliberate look at this. And when we take a deliberate look at this, we also need to evaluate the situation. That's part of considering it, evaluating the situation. 
So let's evaluate the situation. I have a flat tire. That's a fact. I can see it. Let's consider it a little bit deeper. God is with me. That is a fact. I put the two together. I have a flat tire, but God is with me. He's going to help me one way or the other, because I trust in Him. Therefore, it makes all the difference in the world. You see, although I can't control the circumstances that come my way, I can control my response to them. Let's go on in this a little bit further. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. Now, if you have a good understanding of the Bible, you'll recognize that he's not saying, oh, I have a flat tire. Let me stop and thank God for my flat tire. Nobody wants to do that. I never wanted to do that. We don't want to thank God when somebody in our family is ill. We don't want to thank God when we're going through a challenging or rough time about the challenges. We don't want to thank God about such terrible disease as cancer. Why would we thank God for evil? But we understand when we know the Bible a little bit that it says, well, we thank God in that situation. What does that mean? It means that within the context of the situation, again, considering the, the overall situation, I have a problem and God is with me. And that's the most important factor. So I don't thank God for the terrible problems that are coming my way and the terrible evils that happen around me. But I can thank God that within the situation, he gives me strength. He gives me help. He gives me guidance. He gives me encouragement. He gives me wisdom. He gives me hope. I can thank God in the situation because He is with me and He gives me all of this. Let me share with you a few passages from the Bible which talk about these various things that I've been sharing with you. From the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9, it says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave or forsake you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And in Psalm 55 and verse 22, Cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Isaiah 58 and 11. And the Lord will guide you continuously and satisfy your desire in the scorched places. Make your bones strong and you shall be like watered gardens, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. I love the imagery. You can close your eyes and actually picture this if you take a few moments. You have to dig past the snow and the ice to see the water. I understand that, but use your imagination. Isaiah 43 and verse 2. And again, listen to the imagery of this one. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. Flames will not consume you. Isn't that beautiful imagery there? That's the care of God. That is the ability of God, too, to deliver on his promises. And as we read earlier on in Isaiah 40, verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then you can see down below, there's a lot more. And there's many, many more, and I can't quote them all. But I read one this morning, and I wanted to quote that with you. It was just from our daily bread. But it covered a thought that I really wanted to talk about as well, too. Because you see, this morning I want us to talk or look at our responsibilities as Christians to respond in faith to the crises that come our way. Understanding that there are times in our lives when we can be so discouraged 
it's hard to look up. So discouraged that we don't feel we can encourage other people. And what do we do at those times? Do we look at ourselves and criticize ourselves and say, I shouldn't be like this because after all, I'm a Christian? Remember this, that when we're discouraged, God is not looking down at us saying, you don't trust me. God is looking down at us and saying, I will help you just where you are. Psalm 18 and 16, he reached down from on high and took hold of me and drew me out of deep waters. David, when he wrote these words, he was being pursued by Saul, the king of Israel. All David wanted to do was, was to serve the Lord's chosen. And yet here is Saul, who at one time was his friend, is now his bitter enemy, seeking to kill him. And David is in the pits of despair. But he doesn't give up, and he chooses just to reach out to God. And he says, God reached down from on high to uphold me and drew me out of the deep waters. God is there for us when we need him. But again, we talk about what is our responsibility? Paul says to the Thessalonians in 5 and 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So, what makes a difference is our attitude. And our attitude is helped by our faith in God. And our faith is developed through knowing God's Word. All of these things are interconnected. And, you know, sometimes you see that circumstances make people very bitter. But other times it makes them better. And I know this is rather simplistic, but I like it nonetheless. What is the difference between bitter and better? It's one letter. The letter I. <laughs> A letter I. It's all about me and my attitude and my willingness to make the right choices. And that is something that we have to understand that through God we continue to have the choice, the ability to choose to respond in faith. Viktor Frankl, the Jewish psychologist, he spent years in a concentration camp in Germany. He stated this. Listen, to the, listen carefully to his statement. He said, they stripped me naked. They took everything. My wedding ring, my watch. I stood there naked before them. And all of a sudden I realized at that moment in my life, they could take everything from me, my wife, my family, my possessions. But they could not take away my freedom to choose how I would respond. We do have a choice. And God will give us, if we ask, the ability to choose to respond in faith. In Psalm 34, in verse 1, the psalmist states this, I will bless the Lord at all times. It's a choice. It's not because of circumstances. It wasn't because he was sitting by a nice beach in Cancun, Mexico, writing these words, Oh my heavens, I will bless the Lord at all times. He made the choice in the difficult moments. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Let me share this story with you about Stephen and Greta. Stephen and Greta, they had faced more than their share of life's problems. In 2001, their 19-year-old daughter suddenly passed away for medical reasons. This was devastating for them. They described her as a young Christian girl with faith, and she was doing a lot to help and encourage others. And they went through this terrible grief, asking such questions as, why would such a, a beautiful, young, gracious woman be taken? Why would this happen to our daughter? Why did it happen to us? Then they said they made a choice. 
And they chose to commit themselves to work through the pain, asking God for help. And they also made the choice that they wanted to help others. Now part of this journey of growth was that Greta and Stephen realized that they needed to reach out to a young boy in Kenya that their daughter had been sponsoring through Christian Children's Fund. And they wanted to help the community where this boy lived. Stephen was a, or is a medical professional, so he wanted to do something to help. And so they flew down to this community. And again, they were struck by a level of suffering that they weren't ready for. And again, this was almost overwhelming. And as they were trying to help, they saw many hundreds of people on a daily basis who they couldn't do anything for, who they couldn't help. And they said this was very discouraging for them. But once again, they chose to continue on. And they decided that they wanted to help to start an orphanage in this community because there were a lot of homeless children. But they also wanted a place where adults could come and get help too. And so they extended the orphanage to become not only just an orphanage, but a school and a medical center. And they said, we realized that we couldn't help everybody, but we could help those who we could help. And in their own words, they said this, by choosing to ask God for help with our own problems, he literally did change our pain into joy. You see, you can't just explain these words simply by saying, what does James mean when he says, consider it pure joy? I can't just give this to you and say, I hope you understand. You have to paint a picture so that you can visualize this in your mind, how it works. Let me read again those words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking, not lacking anything. And then in verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. This is what he's talking about here. You, you can experience pure joy only when you make those choices to trust God and to ask God for help and then to ask God to help you to do something for others. I said earlier on, this is all about our personal responsibility. Don't you hate it when you get to that point? I'm going to make it very clear. I'm going to be like James. I shared with this, you la uh, this with you last week, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. We're going through difficult times. And we have a lot of expectations we put out there. And then God turns around and he says these words. And what does the Lord require of you? And when I say this, I'm included in the group, so don't think I'm just pointing a finger. I'm not. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what he requires of us. So I have a few questions to ask me. If you want to listen, it's your choice. But these are personal questions. Am I willing to walk the walk, no matter what comes my way? Is my faith real in God? Real enough that when I'm going through difficult times, I'm not going to be lashing out in anger, but I'm going to be looking up in hope and saying, God, help me. Am I willing that others would see only my pain, but also my hope? You see, we have a responsibility as Christians. The sad reality is, we live in glass houses. You know the old saying about, if you live in glass houses, don't throw stones. When you live in a glass house, other people are looking. And sometimes you would like to say, could you turn off the cameras? I'd like a few moments to myself. I want a meltdown right now. I don't want anybody to see this. But people look at us. And why do they look at us? Because 
We're proclaiming that we are followers of Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? We never say that we're perfect, but we say we're followers of Jesus. Nonetheless, they're looking at us and saying, does it make a difference in their life? Isn't it making a difference in their life? And that's what they're hoping to see. They're hoping to see. There are a lot of people who will be out there trying to criticize us, but there are many who are looking because they're hoping to see. In Romans chapter 12 and 12, he says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Oh my heavens, did he say that to me? Be joyful in hope? Does he realize what I'm going through? And yet he wants me to have hope and at the same time be joyful, patient in affliction. He hasn't had to endure the traffic jams that I've had to go through. I talked to one young fellow the other day and he said, I learned a valuable lesson he said about anger. He said, I have to learn how to control my anger. He said, I was driving along and somebody kept cutting me off and said, I got tired of it. And so I pulled out and tried to pass him. And he said, I'm going down the road trying to pass him. And I'm looking at him. And then I looked ahead and there was a vehicle right in front of me. And he said, as try as best as I could, I couldn't avoid hitting the vehicle completely. He said, God was with one of us. He said, because the other vehicle had minor scratches, my vehicle was completely total. I ended up in the hospital. My answer was, God was with both of you. You may not have realized it at the time, but you're telling me you learned a valuable lesson. Do we take seriously what the Bible teaches? Do we believe that problems, even the most challenging of problems, can be purposeful? that pain can have purpose and meaning. If we embrace this reality, then we not only bring hope to ourselves and joyful hope through God, but we give hope to other people. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. See the powerful word here of hope. And that through the Holy Spirit we can not only have hope and peace, but we can have joy as well too. Let me show you the difference that hope makes in the lives of others. I think many of us know what took place in Nepal in 2015. In April of that month it was a devastating earthquake. And it was all over the news, wasn't it? Let me give you a few facts and figures around it. During that earthquake, there were over 9,000 people who lost their lives. And 3.5 million people were left homeless. <clears throat> no shelter, no food, no heating fuel. And in the midst of all of this, they're grieving the loss of their loved ones. The pain, of course, amplified by their living conditions. Almost the entire city of Kathmandu was destroyed. Many mountain climbers, Napoli's guides, tourists, who had gone up to have an experience of a lifetime were either killed or stranded on Everest, in Kathmandu, and in some of the villages leading up to the mountain, villages such as Duchang and Langtang. In the village of Langtang, and understand this, prior to that, the village was a very beautiful village and you could almost imagine how beautiful it would be in the little valley looking up and you would see Everest there before you. And these lovely homes dotting the, the valley and into the village. After the earthquake there was hardly a building that was left standing. There was a lot of local, a lot of pain for the locals as they were looking at what they had lost not only in the buildings and the provisions and the possessions, but in family members and loved ones as well, too. There was a lot of anger that turned to rage. There were a lot of tourists stranded in this village, but there were a group of tourists from Israel, six young men who had decided that they wanted the experience of a lifetime, and so they're going to climb up or walk up to base camp on Mount Everest. The night before the earthquake struck, they were staying in a hotel in the village of Langtang. The village, as I said, and the hotel had been completely destroyed. And the Israelites became a target of the anger 
of the residents there. And who could blame them after all that they've gone through? Threats were made. Some even picked up stones and throwing it at the young Israeli men, hitting some of them. Soldiers were there, fortunately, and they intervened to save their lives. And they assured the Israelis, as long as we're here, you're safe. And then one young Israeli said that afternoon a helicopter came and took all of the soldiers away because they feared for their lives. And he said, we were left there by ourselves. And the villagers came up to them and they said, we will never let you be rescued. You will never leave this place. And they were in fear of their lives. Now they were angry at the villagers and the villagers were angry at them. One young man had a satellite phone with just enough juice. This is not coincidence either. Right? This is God. And he said he had enough juice to send out a message telling about where they were and their desperate situation, asking for help. The next day, an Israeli helicopter landed in the village. They were expecting a military helicopter, and instead it was this red and white helicopter. And out from the helicopter stepped a military man in shorts and t-shirt. The Israeli boy said, I was looking for his gun. He's here to rescue us. And this man, dressed in a shorts and t-shirt, walked right into the middle of the villagers. And in the Nepali language stated this, we are here to help everyone. And in that moment, the anger and rage turned to relief and even joy. Why? Well, listen to what the Israeli soldier said in an interview. He said, I thought, what are we going to do if I come into this village to rescue only our fellow countrymen? How will that go? He said, I needed to bring a message that could change everything. He said, I needed to bring them hope. And it worked. You see, when we share hope with people, it changes everything. I love the statement of one of the, uh, two of the Israeli men who said, after this, we wish we tried harder to understand the pain of the villagers. You see how it changes everything? They were united by hope. <clears throat> Our hope in desperate times brings hope to others. So now I'm going to give these words from Jesus, which will help us all, I believe. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus stated this. <clears throat> He said, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he was giving them instructions that later on they would fully grasp and understand. You see, the reality is that the world tried its worst to destroy Jesus and to destroy his hope and to detract him from his purpose and mission. But we know it never worked. And Jesus was telling him this. He said, you will understand that this world tried its worst to destroy me, but instead, I have victory over this world. And this same victory that I have will be yours in me. That's what he's telling us today. A dear friend of mine is lying, dying, gasping for breath, in terrible agony. Their son is in desperation. What do I do to help? The son tells me that when his mother was gasping for breath, he could hear her slow down in her breathing as she prayed. And then he said, after she prayed, she'd start singing. Her faith, he said, gave me strength. You get the point. God will give us strength. 
and our faith can give strength to others as well.